All right, everybody, game number one is on, and we have already the final. Well, it's actually the only game because we're having a best of one in this case. Semi-final of the qualifier for the North America version of the End of the Storm. And right now we have an immediate Tacita first ban because we're in Tomb of the Spider Queen for our best of one here. The Bob Ross fan club is facing up against Cognitive. Kelthas, Turanda, very solid bans here that the Bob Ross fan club could go for right now. And it is Turanda that they ban out. So at this point, it's actually going to be a really interesting match because the Bob Ross fan club, they have been wrecking opponents left, right, bottom and center. I mean, these guys have been extremely strong. They've been doing so well. And right now, personally, I just want to see how they are exact, how cognitive feels like they can take them down. And that early start with the Sylvanas is already an interesting choice. I mean, normally when you're talking about a first pick, you're thinking along the lines of an Uther, an ETC, a Kel'Thas, maybe a Murid in here. Sylvanas is not too bad, and especially in Tomb of the Spider Queen, she kind of shines, but picking her first, that's commitment right there. The Bob Ross fan club can, of course, already imagine that this is all about the pushing power, right? So they still start with the Kel'thas first. They have now ETC, Uther, and Muradin that they can also choose from. That would be the standard picks. Let's just put it like that. They can go for other combos as well, though. Keep that Zagara in mind. If you don't pick that Zagara, is Cognitive going to commit to an early Zagara and try to play with a massive amount of pushing heroes against uh, Bob Ross fan club? That's one of the things that they have to think about right now because Sylvanas first, it always leaves you in the moment where you're sitting like, wait a second. So Bob Ross still goes pretty traditional. They go into the ETC. As I said, the standard picks here would have been Uther, ETC or Muradin. And they choose ETC as a frontliner. Cognitive, on the other hand, with the commitment to Sylvanas on the first pick, could now head into the Zagara as well. Because I fairly believe that Bob Ross is either going to pick the hero or ban it out. But now we have a Jaina first. And, well, Jaina already a nice counterpart to Kalthas, of course. Nice burst damage as well. Are they still going to commit to another damage hero or not? At this point, it's a little bit more likely that we're going to see that Muradin for them. At least it's one of the best solo tanks that we currently have in the game. And oftentimes he's even, like in the Chinese scene, he's even banned out. And in all the other scenes, we're seeing him oftentimes uh, picked early. And there he is. Muradin is chosen and it makes sense. So the Bob Ross fan club, they would probably like to play with an Uther here if they get the opportunity to. So it's unlikely that they're going to ban him out. They could ban something along the lines of... They could ban a supporter, actually. They could say, hey, we want to take that Uther, we're going to ban another supporter out, but it's a little bit of a, it's a tricky spot because you don't know what exactly is going on there. We have, in terms of bans, Uther, Sonya is a very good ban here now too. Tyrael is oftentimes banned out, depending on what exactly you want to run for. But Bros would, in my opinion, be well advised to uh, probably not ban Tyrael and Uther because that puts them into a spot where they will get at least one of the two and that combos very well with ETC no matter what they get. They ban Zeratul instead and that alone already makes quite a bit of sense. Zeratul is a bit more popular on the North American server than it is on the European and also the Chinese one. But now Cognitive find themselves in a situation where no matter what they ban out, Bob Ross has still very nice combo potential. They can go into, uh, for example, Arena for Seasoned Marksman, they can go into the Uther for the ETC, or they can simply go into the Tyrael that I already mentioned. Cognitive is most likely going to ban one of these guys out, but they can't ban out two. So they find themselves in a spot where no matter what they do, Bob Ross is going to get some very nice combo potential of the two heroes that they already have. Zagara is another hero to consider at this point. Bob Ross could have banned out, decided against it. Cognitive is getting rid of Sonya first. So now Bob Ross can go into Zagara, Uther, they can go into Uther Tyrael, they can, uh, yeah. I, I actually think that these three are probably the ones that they think about the most right now. Then there is still, of course, another damage dealer to consider. I mentioned him earlier, Reyna. He can really do quite a bit with a Season Marksman stack on this map in particular, um, but still depends a bit on how exactly you want to play it. Uther. A bit of a no-brainer. Could still see that Tyrael, could still see that uh, Reyna. Depends very much on how they want to play it. If you go for a Tyrael, for example, right now, you already have some decent damage. You can build him either with the Regeneration Master build that gives him a lot of tankiness, or you can go for Smite, since you just say, hey, we have ETC, he can go into a couple of heal times. We have an Uther, Tyrael has his shields, but they decide for a false state here, which I find pretty cool. I've been talking in the last few games, uh, at least the games that we had on the North American server, how the NA server doesn't really respect false that a whole lot and has more of an emphasis on two other damage heroes, whereas Europe is just worshipping Falstad right now. And Bob Ross Fan Club is one of the few teams that have played Falstad a couple of times in the North America qualifiers for the End of the Storm. And they do it again on a map that is a little bit atypical for Falstad. It's not like the hero isn't played here, 
but it's not the biggest map. And oftentimes Falstead gets a lot of his potential from big maps where he can just like quickly change lanes and cross long distances. So that's something that is pretty cool. But in this case, it of course works also well. Just because Two of the Spider Queen is not the biggest map out there doesn't make the hero useless all of a sudden or anything. Cognitive, they have a few decent picks now that they can aim for. They need a healer. And we are still in the North American scene, of course. So we could see something along the sides of Rega. But Malfurion oftentimes played as the counterpart to Kalthas. In the European scene, I'd say that we would probably see a Charism at this point. But as we are in North America, I could definitely also see a few of the heroes uh, that I just mentioned. Rega can be quite nice if you are afraid of that burst potential. If it's a little bit more about, well, dishing or neglecting the Kalthas, damage negating it, then we could see Malfurion. But it is as expected before Rega as their heals. And now they could still head into that Tyrael actually. I mean Tyrael can really work nicely with the setup that they already have. It would give them a very nice front line or they could still drop that Zagara that we've been mentioning at the beginning of the entire endeavor here. There's very little else that they can head into. I wouldn't really play melee assassin with the setup necessarily. They have Sylvanas and Jaina already for good damage. It's all a question of whether they feel that Muradin is going to be strong enough. Yes or no. I mean, theoretically, if we were on another server, I would throw a Nuborak into the mix, but I don't really believe that we are going to see him here. He was played a couple of times in the North America tournament in the qualifiers, but not so sure. They played with the Melee Assassin after all. They play Kerrigan, all right? It's going to be not easy to really keep her alive. I feel that's a bit tricky. Kerrigan with only the Rega support here, I'm not quite sure if that's going to work out for them the way that they intend, but they have a bit of lockdown with Muradin, and Jaina has damage. If they can combo the three heroes together, they can really make something happen here. It's a bit of a risk, though. They really need to build up some momentum to make this setup work. The Bob Ross fan club. Tyrael is still there. Can still be used if they want to. They have the potential to go into a hero like Zagara, uh, but in general, a bit more stun. Like, I feel like Ethereal would probably be quite nice for them. Or simply head into a, Jeh into a Johanna, which can also be very, very good. Question is just simply, do they want to play ETC solo, yes or no? And if they want to have another front liner, then Johanna and Tyrael are probably the best bets in uh, this particular case. It depends on what they're looking for. Tyrael has those extra shields, he has the mobility, he can go in together with ETC when he uses his power slide, whereas Johanna is a little bit more robust and can just like withstand a lot of the pressure that we are seeing at the front line from Cognitive, especially of course because of she has the iron skin that she can use whenever she wants to. It is a Leoric instead. A lot of the stuff still applies to him. Leoric is, of course, well, he's pretty decent against Muradin also with the Drain Hope here. Personally, I would have liked one of the two heroes that I mentioned a bit more. Then again, I'm a little bit too... Uh, it's still a bit the EU meta that comes through there. But in this case, Leoric can, of course, on the map itself push back lanes quite nicely, which helps. Can at the beginning of the match, for example, even play the counterpart of Sylvanas if you really want to. And you also get a lot of regeneration uh, globes out of, for your reanimation on this map in particular. So he's definitely a good choice. Not a bad choice whatsoever. He's lacking that extra stun that the other heroes kind of would have given them. But in this case, it's still all working out. Against someone like Jaina and Carrigan, personally, I would have preferred Sanctification on Ethereal because you can negate a lot of that Rombo combo potential there. But the Leoric is definitely a solid choice and it's also something that NA chooses, I think, a little bit more even than the European scene right now. All in all, solid draft for both of the teams. So guys, let's jump in into the game and find out which team is going to make it to the finals here of the North America qualifier for the End of the Storm, Cognitive or the Bob Ross Fan Club. It is time for the Bob Ross Fan Club once again. They're playing today in our semi-final at the end of the Storm North America against Cognitive. So yeah, we have our game and uh, it is Tomb of the Spider Queen, which I personally love to see here a little bit more often. In the European meta we currently don't see too much, but here in North America we still have the map in play. Currently to the left side it is of course the Bob Ross Fan Club. We have McIntyre on Leoric, Airho on ETC, Azuna on Kelthas, Arthalon on Falstad and Kenma on Uther. And to the right side of the map, it's Glorang on Kerrigan. We have Ayakona on Rhaegar, Skalal on Muradin, Six on Jaina, and Caterpillar is playing Sylvanas. Already in the mid lane, Arthalon on his bird is flying in straight away. The talents, we have a few choices already that we need to talk about. Level 1, Winter's Reach, the increased range on the Frostbolt. A very interesting talent to take on a map like Tomb of the Spider Queen. The reason is actually quite simple. This is the map for, the, like for any kind of regeneration globe talent. If you have these Regeneration Master, Conjurer Pursuit talents, Reanimation, then this is the map that you're really looking at. 
And to see a hero like Jaina going to anything else but Conjurer's Pursuit here is always blowing me a little bit away. Because this is quite interesting. I mean, we have seen a very high focus on the Icelands in general, but in this case, having the level 1 commitment here already, that's quite something. So, I'm curious to see how that works out. The extra range can, of course, be quite nice. I mean, like, you get a lot of benefits out of that. Don't get me wrong, it's not like the talent's garbage or anything. I mean, you have, for example, the reach towards the turn-in points here, when the opponent is attempting to turn in the gems. You can just, like, simply use the talent. You can also, like, chase down heroes that are trying to get away from you. So all of that stuff is going to work out quite nicely. As already mentioned during the draft, we're having with that Carrigan a bit of a risk that Cognitive was willing to take because that Carrigan can be a liability or it can be their biggest assets depending on the question if they can jump in and get the lockdown. Uh, Arthelon is, yeah, a bit ballsy here. I mean, that is, yeah, that's a lot of optimism that we just saw with that, uh, that move forward. But he didn't die, and that is a big start. Up to the top lane, by the way, we have quite some pressure. Both of the towers have been eliminated here. McIntyre and Zuna were moving in with the rest of the team here too. Arrow with his ETC. So yeah, these guys are definitely doing quite some work. The thing is, though, we see at the bot lane the exact same thing, because we have both of the teams focus for push now. And with false stat and the season marksman level 1, that's going to be nice. That lockdown against Caterpillar. He gets away though, but on the other hand, it could be the end of Glorung. Carrigan is nearly dying. Kenma is moving away just in the last second. So far, nobody died in this game, but yeah, that was a close one there for sure. Reanimation on Leoric, of course, the standard talent for him on this map, particularly useful thanks to all those regeneration globes that you are going to get over time. Arthelon is trying to just soak as many of these waves as he can from the Season Marksman stacks. It's not unheard of to hit 60 stacks at the end of the game here, and that's, of course, incredible damage output that you have, especially now that Blizzard has changed the talents around a bit and you have the power throw on level 4 instead of level 1. You don't have to make that choice anymore between the two. Yeah, nice move by Arcelon here. He's really paying attention to the map and make sure that nobody is able to lock him down. The Bobros fan club in general has been playing absolutely incredible games over the last few, I want to say, weeks. And these guys have been super strong. With Cloud9 currently in China, I feel they are the best team that we have on the North American server, at least at this point, at least from the teams that play in tournaments. So, uh, yeah. It's, they are, of course, also a little bit new and draft a bit different than other teams. And now suddenly we have everybody just like, everybody's starting to get used to them. You know what I mean? Like they know how strong they are, they know how to respect them. There's a kill against Leoric already in the mid lane. So that pressure play that we have with those rotations between mid and top is already coming into play now for Cognitive. And Cognitive is still a little bit ahead when it comes to the experience. So they are looking pretty decent here. We have, by the way, on the level 4 talent for Jaina, no additional Iceland talent, but instead it is, it's not the Ice Shards, instead it is the Snowstorm. And a commitment into the middle. Aho is in a bit of trouble. Could actually die here. He is going to die. He's moving into the wrong direction. And the cow is not going to make it. Well, eventually he's going to die. And there's the jump from the Countess Carrigan. She takes him down. Glorung with a good kill. And that is kill number two against the Bob Ross fan club. So, let's see. They came out of nowhere and started to drop everybody. It's a bit of a Cinderella story. After they got released from Tempo Storm, they formed their own team, and now they are finding themselves at the top of the ranking for the end of the Storm qualifier. Uh, but still, is Cognitive maybe the first team who's able to take them down? So, uh, already Meridian is trying to turn in. He creeps me out every time. I mean, this skin is just so wrong. Pedo Meridian, wanna have some candy? Always a little bit awkward to see that guy in play. At least he didn't go for the pink one. That creeps me out more than anything else. There's the turn in already. The Red Web Weavers are going to be on the way. And we have also level 7 a bit faster now for Cognitive. So pretty cool start for them into the match. We have for now Frost, uh, like Frost Armor taken. Look at that. We actually see the, the kind of anti-melee assassin talents. Oftentimes the talent is taken when there's an Illidan, a Zeratul, or a Sonya in the opponent's team. But of course, in general, it's only it's all about the auto attacks. It doesn't really matter if it's a melee assassin or a ranged assassin. And in this game, it's more about false death than anybody else. Also, of course, now the push at the top. We have Impaling Swarm taken. And here comes the attack that we've been waiting for. Both of the teams on level 7. Lingering Apparition on Leoric. Lockdown against ETC. And this setup that they're running here with Meridian and Kerrigan for the stuns and the damage thanks to Jaina works out quite nicely. Really well, actually. Kenma is trying to dodge. He is going to be taken out as well. Down goes Uther. Four kills against zero. And Cognitive are suddenly making leaps and bounds here. They're jumping in, taking down forts. Once again, Glorung is on the move in. Yeah, there's the Wraith Walk bringing Loric back to safety. And this is snowballing very fast out of the hands of the Bob Ross fan club. Well played here by Cognitive thus far.
that's of course the risk that you run. I mean, what they are using here is a bit of an old school combination. Like these days, you see a setup like this not as often anymore as you did in the past, but they just prove that it's still quite strong. Nowadays, it's more about Utha into uh, ETC, Divine Shielded Mosh Pit, than the damage behind it and using Force Set for extra damage. So the game might turn a bit after level 10 when we're in the mid game. But right now, this is really starting to become a little bit tricky for the Bob Ross fan club because they probably expected a different start into this. But they knew that the setup that is being used by Cognitive is strong with the rotations and the individual hero snipes. So this is something that they are going to try and do right now. Or trying to uh, yeah, run with as long as they can. The problem that the Bob okay, so the problem that the Bob Ross fan club is running into right now is that level 10 hits any second for Cognitive. That means that Cognitive can dominate the two turning points, should be able to get the second Rep Weaver wave. And will, with that, get even farther ahead in experience and most likely always lead with a talent and or lead with a level and if worse comes to worse with a talent. And that's really the whole idea of playing on this map with a setup that tries to snowball. That's what you're trying to do. Um, we have at the same time now the heroics coming into play with the Maelstorm, Ancestral Healing, Avatar. We have also Water Elemental plus Wailing Arrow on the side of Cognitive. And as you can uh, see already, they are about to just like burst these waves away even more. They have a nearly a level lead. There's no level 10 for the Bob Ross fan club, so they are in a bit of trouble because they need to turn in. They have the gems. They can't move to the turn in spots though. And the longer this lasts, the more of these waves are going to be cleared by Cognitive, the more gems they get. And then they can turn in again. And that's what they're trying to do right now. They have already nine and if they turn in another 20 then they will have another web weaver wave and this is something that the Bob Ross fan club is going to try to prevent they're going to try to prevent this as much as they can and then the whole thing of what they're going to do here is just like get level 10 move in and hand in their own gems to counter play that get a web weaver wave on their own drop a couple of structures and close the gap in experience so they have their hands now and that's mosh pit that's also mighty gust once again the jump in Arthalon is blown everybody away dodging uh, nicely the stuns on character and now Airhawk could maybe move in with a mosh pit even. We have the Divine Shield. Nice move. That's the, maybe the party time. Is he going to go in? Yes! And there we go! It's time to dance, baby. But ETC goes down and Glorang gets healed in the hands of the Arthalon flies away. He leaves everybody behind. Not an Ohana moment. Yep, people are definitely left behind in this game. And this is level 12 versus level 10. Wow. The mosh pit was good, the damage was not, there was just not enough damage as a follow-up to drop these heroes. The mosh pit was actually great. I mean, ETC, he paid with his life for it because of that tower dropping him, but besides that, everything was quite fine. The damage output was missing, though, and they couldn't even kill Kerrigan. Instantly, Rhaegar was there with an ancestral healing, keeping her alive, and she just turns around and kills the next two heroes. So great place here on the side of Cognitive. And this, ladies and gentlemen, might be the first map that we see Bob Ross fan club lose. They need to make a crazy comeback happen because at this point another web weaver wave is already descending against them and they lost the fodder at the top lane and the one at the bot lane. Then again, we saw already a couple of matches that they should have lost by any means and then all of a sudden they turned it around with some crazy plays and were able to win the game after all. So this is not over until the fat lady sings and then so far I don't hear anything. Erho, Kenma, Arthalon, McIntyre and Zuna, they're all together clumped up in the mid lane now. The Web Weavers are going to push every lane, but the mid lane is the only one with a fort. Level 13, soon though, for Cognitive. That will be the extra talent, but at this point it's all about the level 10 talents. And they're going to try and take that. So once again, ah, well, Sylvanas of course pushing with this. It's the strength of Sylvanas in general. If you have that hero, it doesn't matter if it's two on the Spider Queen. It can be Battlefield of Eternity, it can be Infernal Shrines, it can be Dragonshire. No matter where you are, if you have something pushing a lane for you, Haunted Mines with the boss with the Golem, for example, and you have Sylvanas disabling these structures, gonna give you so much momentum. Sylvanas is a hero that can bring a snowballing team even farther ahead, and it can be absolutely amazing, and that's what they're currently trying to do here. They disable the towers, they go through the fort, they move to the bot lane, it's level 13 talents now for them with an improved ice block with the wind for Sylvanas who went for the Lost Soul, the cooldown reduction on the Shadow Dagger on level 1. They're having also the healing surge now for Rhaegar. He is going to go for Tidal Waves on level 16 after he already committed to the Chain Reaction and the Spirit Walker's Grace. Healing numbers for him are going to be crazy good if he needs to. And we don't even see Kerrigan going for those shield talents. 
If you look at the European scene, shield talents are really what dominates every single Kerrigan play. We sometimes see Eviscerate taken on level 13, but on North America, it's really like the standard talent for the hero. So shield talents are not as popular as they are in other regions in the world here. This is a bit of a different style of playing the hero, and it's working out quite nicely for Cognitive here. They are starting to jump in again. Oh, and the Mighty Gust, and even the Entomb committed not really to isolate somebody and kill him. No, more so to just make sure that they can get away here. Looking at the damage numbers, and not only the damage numbers, also the heal. 9,000 heal currently on Rhaegar, 13,000 heal on Uther. More so because, let's face it, Rhaegar didn't really have anything to heal. Like, he got one ancestral healing through, and that's not for a lack of him uh, being ready. This is more lack of, uh, lack of opportunity. Nobody really dropped fast enough for him to use one, and now they're trying to turn in again. They don't really have the count yet. McIntyre is attempting to turn in, but Iacona is already waiting there. And yes, this is just not going to happen. The Lingering Apparition is going to bring him to safety with the Hardened Bones, but this just shows how well Cognitive is currently controlling this map. They're making sure that there's just absolutely nothing that their opponent can do, but now it's level 13 talents versus 13 talents, and it's Chain Bomb times. Chain Bomb time, and the Mosh Pit against two with the Divine Shield. There we go. Now we're talking. This is the damage that we've been waiting for. It's the instant double kill against Murrin and Kerrigan. And what a great Mosh Pit. I mean, for this Mosh Pit, someone should give Airhoy a medal. Seriously. That was exactly the two heroes that could have stunned him out of it. He didn't even need that Divine Shield. Yeah, I guess, okay, against Sylvanas is not too bad. If she drops that Wailing Arrow, then, of course, it's going to interrupt the Mosh Pit, too. But besides that, when it comes to stun, he did exactly what he had to do. He caught both of them. Very well played. That's the double killer they were looking for. And look at their count in gems. They have 114 gems. And, guys, just to highlight that again, they just released that Weavers. That's a surplus that we're talking here, right? So that's another two turn-ins right there. They can turn in three times in a row overall if they want to. It's crazy. This is their, this is their chance. They lost a few heroes, but they didn't really lose any gems. Right now, they have a massive amount of gems here. And we're already seeing them moving around. I mean, we have the chain bombs now over here. Leoric moving away with the Lingering Apparition. The Lingering Apparition in general is just that talent where you know that the SS Leoric is going to just piss you off the entire time. The entire game is going to be annoying. Carrigan dead, and well, guess what? Muradin is dead again. Arthalon might die over here. Ah, oh, there's the heal in the last second, keeping him alive. Maybe McIntyre can be dropped with a level 1 talent. That's the extra range, of course, on the Iceland. But nope, Jaina is not able to move in for this one either. And nice attempt to lock down Caterpillar, but he moves away before that gravity lap hit. Still, level 16 talent first for the Bob Ross fan club. I mean, seriously, can somebody kill these guys? Are these guys, like, are they invincible? Are they always winning or what's going on here? They were so far behind. It was the chance for Cognitive to really take them down. But at this point, we're having, again, a lead for them in experience. They turned this around. They are behind in kills still, but they have the extra talent. Speed Metal on level 16. The Arcane Barrier has been chosen on level 16. We're seeing Consume Vitality now for the Auric Benediction and the Hammer Time for... I was about to say Brightwing, but I meant Fawcett, of course. It's another, like, flying thingy that can be quite annoying. So, yeah, that's, that's where the confusion, uh, the confusion comes from. Turn in number two, and they still have 73. They still have 73 gems. Wow. Like, th if they don't lose here, like, if they don't lose, like, a hero or two and then lose the gems, then they are just going to turn in right afterwards. Level 16 versus level 16 with finally the tidal waves coming into play on the side of Rhaegar. We have, of course, Carrigan with blood for blood with this particular build here. Numbing Blast is taken on Jaina, and we have the Cold Embrace with the Stone Form and Muradin. So let's see how exactly this is going to work out at this point. Once again, Aho up at the front. All of their rogue abilities are, by the way, ready. Every single one of them. They're trying to get the vision here, of course, behind the wall, and then they can start to move in. All the waves are pushing. All the lanes are moving in. Once again, we have the move here. Arthalon, Arthalon, Aho, McIntyre. They all are in position and are ready for ETC to go in with a Divine Shield and go for the Mosh Pit. 17 versus 16 in levels, and they go for the first keep. And the keep at the top lane, by the way, has already suffered a fair amount of damage. So it's not only the one in the mid lane that is being attacked right now. No, they are everywhere. They're dropping the Phoenix once again. Down goes the Web Weaver. Top lane is still being pushed, and it's very, very low. Glorong is the only one over here. And there we go. They are jumping in again. Arthalon, Zuna, Airhorn, McIntyre, all in the mid lane, going for that keep starting to take him down right now and at the same time yep there it is silo and there's oh glorung jumps in and the divine shield for false that 
Well played. But false that dies anyways because Uther isn't there to heal him. He got the Divine Shield, flies away, Uther isn't in range, can't heal him, and he dies, and Uther does too. Now all of a sudden, it's again 17, well, versus 18 in the sec. We have still 50 HMs, they lost a few, but they didn't lose enough. The bottom lane is still being pressured, and, well, the move to the top, it looks like they're gonna try and go for keep here. Guys, this is getting pretty intense at this point. This is getting really intense right now. Once again, they're starting to move in, and this can get very, very annoying because, well, the rest of the waves are not pushing the keeps just down, but if you look at the minimap, you can really tell how low they are on hit points already, the mid lane and the top lane in particular, but up here to the top, only the wall has been eliminated. We're still having two heroes that are currently uh, just ba coming back into the play. That's, of course, Falstead and Uther. So, yep, there's a chance. Already turn an attempt here in the middle. They have enough gems. They do, but can they turn them in? It looks like they can. Yes, Caterpillar serves the last few gems, and now we're going to see the Red Bear Reverse in play again. Looking at the stats again, to give you guys a bit of an idea here. When it comes to damage, we have Falls at 19,000, Kalathas at 23, and Sylvanas with 43,000 hero damage and 150,000 siege damage. This hero can be so insane, and they are really going ham with her right now, aren't they? So the web weavers are pushing, and they're trying up at the top lane. Once again, everybody's already here. They're starting to go for a fight. Uh-oh, ETC is there with Kerrigan. He's about to slide in. He can, though. Muradin is get stunned once, twice. Gravity laps, too. He's not jumping away yet. Gloran moving away with Wraithwalk. But, the, ooh, that was, what was Gloran doing? Gloran uses his Maelstrom very early there. Did not have the opportunity to go for anybody, and it just gets blasted away by the Mighty Gust, as does everybody else. So their heroic abilities are all in cooldown, except for the Ancestral Healing, whereas most of the uh, heroic abilities that we see on the side of the Bob Ross fan club are still ready to be used. So they move around, defend the ball mid lane now. The keeps have not really taken any damage yet, but they're starting to attack the top lane once more. It's a bit ballsy with all of the heroics already used. So I'm not quite sure if that's the smartest move on their part right now. They're just posturing around a bit, and yeah, they're not really committing to a fight, and nor should they. I mean, with all of their heroic heroics already down, if you go up against an opponent that has every single one still off cooldown, then you're going to run into quite some trouble, and that's exactly what's going to potentially happen. That's a ballsy move as well. I mean, yeah, we're talking boss right now. Just trying to sneak in, but it looks like the Bob Ross fan club is completely oblivious to it. They're trying to turn in. They're going to get the turn in completed, but they lost the boss at the top. McIntyre is moving away now. Lingering Apparition is going to help them with that. Blue Web Weavers are descending, and of course they have to defend against the boss up to the top regardless. But it also means that the mid lane, well, either they're not going to see Cognitive push, or they risk losing the mid lane keep. And that might be actually what's going to happen here. Top lane keep should be annihilated now. Oh, there's the ETC. It's only one though. Kerrigan is there. Nobody's dying. Mighty Gust is being used. Sylvanas is dead already. They go for Jaina. Jaina with the ice block. She might still die. ETC is on the way. Nice. And Tomb. Everybody on point once again for the Bob Ross fan club. Glorung on the other hand. He is a bit isolated and goes down. Kerrigan, the focus is there. Arthalon is moving away but gets healed as Skylon Muradin is trying to kill him. Now it's a three versus five. The keep is eliminated. The boss is gone. But guess what? The mid lane over here is, of course, not going to withstand this pressure play. Nope. The level 20 talents are now also ready. And we're already seeing a McIntyre moving up to the top. They want to have keep number two. And there's no, way, no reason why they shouldn't get it. Or are they going to go for even more than that? Spectral Leech on 20, Double Bolt of the Storm for ETC and Kalthas. We see no Nexus Frenzy, but instead the Epic Mount taken at level 20 talent, plus also Redemption now. So McIntyre moving around into the middle. They took two of the keeps down already, and falls dead with a very quick flying down to the bot lane, since of course he has that Epic Mount, so he has easy mobility on the map. He's sacrificing a bit of his damage output, most of the uh, servers so far are using Nexus Fancy, but it's a situational talent, and if you are playing the hero like Arthalon does, mobility is absolutely key. 20s are now ready also for the opponent's team. Cognitive has their 20s as well. It's one keep versus two keeps right now. And for now, we are seeing, well, once again, Muradin going straight into that rewind. So does, by the way, Rhaegar did not go into the potential Storm Shield. Muradin, by the way, can, of course, also use that Hardened Shield, which we oftentimes see. But just recently, we have a bit more of a focus to that rewind again, which allows you to go for the double hop, or you can just like, go for the Storm Bolt, which is also very, very strong. Right now, we have a triple Bolt of the Storm. 
that gives them so much mobility as well that they can use to just like jump away there. Arthelon, Kenma, Zuna, Aho, they all go for another turn in attempt now. They don't have enough gems, of course, but still, they're trying to get rid of the ones that they have. Carrigan could turn in, and she is actually... Well, actually, she doesn't have any. Who has those gems, those 42? Looks like Ayakona has quite a lot of them, and Jaina has the rest. So they are rotating over again. This is getting a fun game. This game isn't over yet, but of course the Bob Ross fan club is at least when it comes to the structural position in the game in the better situation since they already dropped two of the keeps and there's only one remaining. Could look at that, that, that siege damage on uh, Kalthas. 210,000. Wow. Falstead, by the way, really catching up in uh, single target damage now. They're having him already at 32,000. So, uh, yeah, those season marksman stacks are really coming through. And he didn't even go for Nexus Frenzy. Nexus Frenzy is probably the most popular talent level 20 for Falstead when you're talking about the Chinese and the European scene. Here on the North American server, we actually see the talent also quite a bit. But as I already highlighted a little bit earlier, when we're talking about uh, Arthelon, he's so mobile with his hero in general that the epic mount really works. And, I mean, he can make quite some plays with that talent. It's a cool talent to have have so it's by no means bad 10 kills against six against them by the way it's level 21 versus 20 we're 21 minutes into the game and the only camp or the only structure that's still standing next besides the core of course is that keep down to the bot lane and they are already starting to move in for that as we speak mcintyre ken marathlon getting into position cooldowns are already for both of the teams so this is the opportunity to just like go in and drop that keep it's very low already but they're going for kerrigan first blinks away with the ball of the storm and again the mighty gust being used mighty gust with a lower cooldown by the way that ball of the storm so mighty gust will be up again when kerrigan is still looking at that cooldown ticking down on the bolt Aho up at the front, doing cow things with his ETC, waiting for a chance to slide in and use that mosh pit. They're just poking with damage, and that keep is nearly gone. I mean, there's not a whole lot missing. If Falsa drops the spell or two, or Zuna just moves in for a flame strike, that would be enough. But of course, he wants to be safe in the back line. Here they come, the commitment. Muradin jumps in, ETC with the Divine Shield. The mosh pit goes for it. Nice Blizzard, though, zoning them out. Arthelon had to move away, and that means that there's no, no damage anymore. Arthelon and Zuna are both low, so it's now ETC. He's getting attacked. Oh, they go for a grab on ETC, but they catch Uther instead. Once more, the attempt to blast him away with the Mighty Gas, but uh, Muradin just jumps over. It. The kill against Uza was an important one, and of course he is back to business now, thanks to Redemption and dying again. Mid lane is being pressured, but the catapults are not going to be uh, strong enough to take that core just yet, at least that is. When it comes to gems, well, we have a very solid situation for both of the teams, in the sense that we see... A particular good position actually for the team around Ayakona here because they have now 42 that they can turn in and that brings them very close to the 65 that they need in total. So yeah, they have a chance to make that work. By the way, talking about like uh, backdoor plays, McIntyre is going in and just is like, hello, there's a keep and well, there was a keep. But that also means that there was still a bit more time for them to turn in more gems. Three right there. Two more gems, and it is going to be another wave of web weavers. That will deep push, of course, quite a bit. I like that McIntyre is actually trying to get these waves out of the picture as fast as he can, because it means that the bot lane is going to push even harder, and that's going to help them a lot. And with his lingering apparition, he can just move easily away once that the opponent is committing to a fight. He will have to be back, though, or at least move back. I would use that B button, to be absolutely honest. They are looking for him. They're looking for him everywhere, but he can't find him, all right? So he moved back down to the bot lane. That allows them to escape right now. Because they need to defend against the Web Weavers now first. This is a pretty difficult wave to deal with right now. We have Zuna, Kenma, Erho, and Arthelon already on their way. And, well, with that, they are going into the mid lane first. Middle and bottom are the two lanes where they still have keeps. Those are the two lanes that they definitely have to defend. And they're already going for the burst damage against the one in the mid lane. McIntyre is, of course, here for the zoning. Glorang with a Maelstrom. They can move away from this. Uh-oh, that was a bit tricky. Arthelon in trouble. Flies away with the epic mount, but again the mosh pit. The Divine Shield comes a bit too late. He's already interrupted. No chance for him to go through with it, but they're moving away now. The Bolt of the Storm being used. Glorang hits too, like a boss. And Utha... Oh my god, he dies again. Utha is down, and they are going straight in to drop McIntyre. But this is a chance for Cognitive to make a lot happen here. They can start to take down structures now. 
maybe at the bot lane. It's a 5 versus 4 situation since Uta is already dead and they are attempting, of course, to take it on here. They have still that Sylvanas and she's disabling all the structures as we speak. The mid keep in trouble. There's no keeps left anymore for the opponent, by the way. Not a single one for Cognitive. They don't have anything left here. 13 kills against 6. Can they go for core? I highly doubt that. Uther is dead for another 30 seconds, but there's no way that they can core it here. At the bot lane, the last web weaver is very low and is not going to make it here. So at this point, we're having once again Skylol, everybody else just posturing around, right? Very well done. And, well, for now, Arthelon is there uh, as well. Skylol is, of course, going to jump away, but they're trying to go in again. Lockdown failed, and the turnaround attempt against Glorum. Bolt of the Storm, Ancestral Healing is hitting. Zuna jumped back in the last second. Look at Jaina, she's nearly down. It's a five versus five again, and they have to move away, but a great entomb that is being used here. Falls that flies in, blasts them into the range. They're trying to go for Jaina. They're going deep for the kill here. Jaina hit the last second. Second Blizzard though and false that is dying, but Kerrigan is also dead. It's a 3 for 1. Divine Shield on Leoric who moves in too, and they are starting to move straight for Muradin. He moves away, he's gonna die eventually. He's just gonna try and put some extra damage onto the keep. It is four heroes dead, and that should be that should be. Could that be GG? Can they move in right now? 40 seconds, is that enough to drop the core without Falstead, without one of the main damage dealers that they have for the auto attacks? They're moving into the mid lane already. It's another 38 seconds until Kerrigan is going to be back. And we're having Sylvanas, of course, on the way back. Sylvanas, what is she doing? She's moving to the left. She cannot possibly think that she can take down that core alone with that minion wave. That's never going to work. Never, ever. We have four heroes already attacking the core of the red team. ETC does have the mosh pit. He could go onto the stairs and use the mosh pit here. They won't even have to use that. It's once again the Bob Ross fan club that is successful here. They make it happen. They take the game. What a play here once more. Great positioning in that last fight. And the Bob Ross fan club, they take the game and win the series. It's close, but they are able to make it happen. GG and very, very well played here by the Bob Ross fan club. All right, everybody, Th that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching the video. I hope that you enjoyed the commentary and also the game. If you really liked it, feel free to also share it with your friends, especially, of course, if they're interested in Heroes of the Storm Esports. And if you like the video, then also hit that thumbs up button on YouTube. And if you want to support the channel and myself, then you can subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that yet. Thanks again for watching today. I really hope that you enjoyed the show. It was a pleasure casting for you. And I hope to see you guys next time with more Heroes of the Storm here on Color TV.